All right, thank you. Good morning. It's good to see you. In the last episode of Joseph, we looked in chapter 37 of the book of Genesis. Today we're in chapter 39. I invite you to turn there. If you don't have your Bibles, uh, there are a few Bibles underneath, and it's found on page 39, Genesis 39, page 39. So last week we talked about how that Joseph was the favored son because he was the 11th son of Jacob and the son, the first son of his favorite wife, Rachel. And we talked last week, if you'll recall, about Rachel and Leah and the competition, the Super Bowl of babies in the book of Genesis and, and all of the things that went on with Bilhah and Zilpah and all of that stuff. Talked about that and how bad it is when parents show favoritism and the coat of many colors, it was not a wise thing for daddy to do, who should have known better because that's what had happened in his life with his father. So we also see that we have the, the understanding that it's, you need to have some emotional intelligence. And when you are 17 years old, sometimes that might be lacking. And that was certainly the case with Joseph as he lorded it over his brothers because he was his father's favorite, and he kind of let that be known. But he also had something else. He had some dreams. And with those dreams, and that word is very prominent in the text, with those dreams, then he began to kind of parade himself and not understanding the damage that it was causing and the rivalry he was having with his brothers. And so today we're looking at this, this next uh, phase of the Joseph story. And the reason that we're doing this is because, and it's in your bulletin, so if you've not read your bulletin intro, this is a, a very important for us to understand. As you see, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. And that this is a, a very important thing that we've got to anchor into. And so we're going to be, we're going to be talking about this regardless of circumstances. God is good all the time. Sometimes we don't understand it. We're going to be talking about that this day. So we're in chapter 39 of uh, page 39 in your pew Bibles. If you would stand out of reverence that we have in our heart for God's Word, I'm going to invite you to read with me verses 1 through 6a. That's that first paragraph, and I'll read the rest of the text. Ready? Now, Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now is a shift. And a lot of times that transitional word will be the word therefore in the New Testament. Paul likes that word. Often you'll find the word but. This word is now. So you know something's up. Now Joseph was handsome in form. That phrase is used four times in the Bible. Do you know who the other three were? Joseph is handsome in, in form. This is a chance to remember this and be really obnoxious with your friends. Did you know who the four handsome men in the Bible are, handsome in form? Number one is? It's okay. You'll be wrong. Moses. Who? <laughs> Moses? That's wrong. Any, <laughs> anybody else? David, I heard David, that, he's number two. Samson, that's wrong too. Saul, I heard Saul. Saul was the first one. He was head and shoulders, that was his favorite shampoo. Head and shoulders above everyone else. 
then David, and then it was one of David's sons who had such luxurious hair that he weighed it. Do you remember? And he, and he also got his hair caught in the tree. And Absalom, that's right. So those are the three in addition to Joseph. See, I mean, why would anybody not come to church to learn something <laughs> of that value? So he is handsome in form and appearance, and after a time, his master's wife, can you say in Hebrew with me, uh-oh, cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. But he refused. And by the way, parenthetically here, this is the note in the book of Genesis, is that the distinction between the person who's going to be blessed always hinges upon this. He refused. He has an option, but he does not choose to go in that way. So Abraham is contrasted with Lot. Lot coalesced. He gave up. He compromised. We see this also with Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael is called a wild donkey of a man, but Isaac is shown with restraint. The third one then is with Esau and Jacob. Esau was a wild, hairy man, and Jacob was showed more restraint. And here is the fourth one, Joseph, in contrast to his crazy brothers who had no brakes. They just had a gas pedal. And so this is, this is key to understanding who gets blessed and who doesn't, because Joseph refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He's not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this? And this is very important. Look at this. This great wickedness and sin against whom? Potiphar? Mrs. Potiphar? No, against God. We'll, we're going to talk about that next week. And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, here, it, here again he shows his restraint, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. One of my favorite axioms is, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. And so he was not going there with her. But Hebrew again, uh-oh. One day, when he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand. Remember, he lost his garment previously to his brothers. Now Mrs. Potiphar gets it and fled out and fled, uh, fight or flee, and got out of the house. As soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled out of the house. She called to the men of the household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as I heard that he lifted my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until her, his master came home, and she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to me to laugh at me, but as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of my house. So may God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Thank you. You may be seated. Do not take the person's hand next to you because they have the flu, okay? <laughs> But let us pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Thank you for coming to church today. There were reasons to avoid, but we're saying that this is our strategic goal for our congregation over the next two years to attend for every Sunday unless you have a reason you know God would approve. Things happen when you're in the room. Things happen when you're in the room. The Holy Spirit is present here. Your heart will be lifted up. You'll catch the flu. You can't do that at home by yourself. Come here and be with us. Be in community. This is so vital to who we are. The Lord was with Joseph. I love this because the Lord was with Joseph. I love the Old Testament, but I really love the New Testament because the New Testament is going to talk about Building on the Old Testament, the Lord was with Joseph, the Lord was with Moses, the Lord was with Samson, the Lord was with David, the Lord. But there, it's always like, it's only the big people. But in the New Testament, Jesus is Emmanuel, which means the Lord is with 
us. We're all included. And so the Lord is with Joseph. The Lord is now with us. That's why we need the New Testament. And from that, then, we see that he is going to have success, and that is going to be known. He is a successful man, and that's a great thing. We all like success. That's a good thing. We'd rather have success than failure. But I would also point out the fact that sometimes success can be challenging. I'm not going to read to you out of Deuteronomy chapter 8. You might want to reference that, but Deuteronomy chapter 8 talks about a real danger, and that is that your pride can usurp itself, and you can, and here's the word, it says over and over, look in Deuteronomy 8, that you can forget the Lord. That this happens, sometimes people meet with success and they really start thinking, I'm really special, I'm a great person. And they forget the Lord. They don't need God because they, they've got other things. And the other things are often is that we love, and we've been talking about this, our stuff. We love our stuff. And so, you know, uh, it's one of those deals that uh, it reminds me of Bill Mason's favorite rapper, Biggie Smalls, who says, mo money, mo problems. Right, Bill? <laughs> so with that, when what happens, we get successful, we don't need God. And Jesus told all kinds of stories about this. People have success. They don't need God. We get proud. We get obnoxious. We get successful. We love our money. We love our stuff and it becomes a barrier. So success is harder to handle than failure. Because when we fail, we say, God, would you help me? And there's a humility that comes. Pride is the worst thing that can happen in a relationship with God. We don't need God, we can do it ourselves. There's a third thing, though, that happens. When we are successful, it's going to attract attention. Now, this is good. Success is good. It attracts attention. It's very good because now somebody's going to pay attention to Joseph Potiphar. He says, this is wonderful. Man, this guy is blessed by God. Everything he does, he's like Midas with a golden touch. Everything works well. However, there's always a downside. What's your greatest strength, your greatest weakness? So here is the downside, Mrs. Potiphar. And so his success and his handsomeness makes him desirable to her. And so this creates a big problem in his life. And so with this, then there's something else that's going to take place because this attraction is going to lead to something else. And that is something that this series is about. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. It leads to suffering. If there is one thing that I could help you with as your pastor would be to understand the importance of having a theology of suffering. Too many Christians think we only need a theology of success. And let me tell you, that is okay. Both of these things are going to happen in your life. You're going to have success. But if you've not suffered yet, it's just because you haven't lived long enough. And you'd better come up right now with a theology of suffering. You better understand this is part of life. It's not always success. You don't always hit a home run. You strike out. You don't always get the promotion. Somebody else gets the job. You don't always have kids with straight A's and straight teeth. Sometimes things happen, and you'd better come up with a theology of suffering. And let me give you four reasons today that I deal with it. Number one, why do we suffer? It's because of sin. And it's always something that's in me, it's in you, it's in everybody. A lot of times, though, what we do with sin is we say, you know, somebody hurt me. But that's true. People will hurt you. But the flip side is we hurt other people. Not only do we need to ask forgiveness, we need to forgive other people. And a lot of times people don't get in touch with the fact that we've shot arrows in somebody else. We always remember how much it hurts us, but that's part of the sin nature as it turns within. 
And so we don't realize that we are culpable too, and that we have created problems in others by showing favoritism, by being proud, by falling in love with our stuff. We don't realize that by escaping our responsibilities to uphold the church by our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. We say that's for someone else. And so we've got to be in touch. What causes suffering? Many times, this is the reason. It's somebody's sin, somebody doing something wrong. It may be us or we may be an innocent victim of the sin of someone else. That happens. But this is a huge thing, and a lot of people say, I don't believe in God because something bad happened. Well, come on, you're going to die. You know that. We don't want Moses limping around, you know, 18, uh, 2,400 years ago. You know, he'd, it's time to put, let Moses go. We're going to die. Everybody's going to die. Sin has entered the world. Death spread to all people because of sin. This is part of life. And we've got to come to terms with that. Second, playing off of that is that sometimes, I tell you, and this is a perplexing thing, is that we just don't understand it. That's why Paul, I'm so glad he shared this and he didn't disclose what his thorn was. He talked about, I've got a thorn in the flesh. That thorn in the flesh, we don't know if it we had visual problems, had malaria, if it was be based on some emotional guilt or something that he had, or if there, he had enemies that were after him. We don't know what was going on in Paul's life, but we're, it's a good thing we don't. But he prayed three times that God would remove the thorn from his flesh, and he didn't have it, and he's trying to make sense of it. Lord, please take this from me. And each time the answer was no. And then finally the answer, you remember in 2 Corinthians what he said. He said, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. And he also wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter. Now we see into a mirror dimly, then we shall see fully as we are fully known. Now we see into a mirror dimly, we don't understand it. Now versus then, and then is when we go to heaven. And let me tell you, my friends, there are some things that will never, ever make sense. You'll never get an adequate explanation. You've got to have in your theology of suffering, you've got to recognize number one is sin, but number two, there are times we just, we don't get it, and we never will. It will never make sense, but we've got to lean into a heavenly vision and say at some point, we don't get it now, but then we shall understand fully. Third is a sense of very important. If I were to highlight one, it might be this one. God is just. And so it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. God is just. We must trust God, even especially in those times that we don't understand it. God is going to take care of everything. We don't have to avenge ourselves. We don't have to be jealous. We don't have to harbor resentment. We can forgive other people because God has forgiven us. And so the sense of justice will take place. So we say, when? <laughs> you don't know, why? Because now we see into a mirror dimly. One of these days we'll understand it. God will judge. God will be just in his judgment. Some people are very worried about hell. Some people say, I'm not, I'm not going to be a Christian because I don't believe in hell. Well, God is just. Leave it at that. It's not my business to say this person's in and that person is an outing. This is not, this is not my deal. God is a just judge. At the end of the day, nobody will ever be able to say that was not fair. God is just. And this is what he's saying. And so we can trust him because he is just. Finally, I would say suffering can have a redemptive purpose that it can refine us. That it can refine us. That is, so many people will say, because I got wounded, because I got hurt, I now have empathy for you. That's why I call myself the pastor of the prostate because I had prostate cancer 
And I've talked to so many men that have been scared out of their minds because I've got this problem and I'm going, I can talk to people because I've been wounded. And you get over the wound and you come back and you can be a voice of counsel, a voice of calmness, and you can have a presence in somebody's life. A woman who has had a mastectomy will understand a language that other women cannot possibly know. And there's something that's very helpful when we trust God and we get through these moments of life, which we all have. Live long enough, you'll have them. Get ready, get prepared, it's coming. If everything's going great in your life right now, that's wonderful. But know that this is part of life, that life is about succeeding and suffering. These two things take place all the time, every day. Today, you'll have some success, and today, you'll have some suffering. You have a wonderful concert at Elton John, and then you can't get out of the parking lot for 30 minutes. <laughs> that happens. That's the way life is. For us to believe that God is going to orchestrate everything so everything's going to be successful is a lie. Life is not like that. Your marriage is not like that. Your children are not like that. Your work is not like that. This church is not like that. Nothing is like that. Nothing is unlimited, going on, forever success. You're going to suffer. But it won't always be suffering. You're going to have some success too. As I think about this, uh, I, I was hesitant to share this with you because uh, some will object, and I understand that, but I think um, in the proper context, uh, I, can, I can share this. Dana and I have watched a Netflix series that should not be watched by, uh, by young children. The language is very rough. But when you understand the context and the sociology of it, it, it was like gripping. It's called Last Chance U University. Last Chance University. And it's about a junior college football team in East Mississippi. There are two of them. The other one is in Independence, Kansas. We've not seen that one. But they have this first year, and there are about eight episodes. It's a documentary. And they show this, uh, these kids that end up at this JUCO. They don't want to be there. Uh, it's in Scuba, Mississippi, population of 700. They don't want to be there. Uh, they're there because they did not qualify academically, or like one kid was at Texas Tech and he did something wrong and he got kicked out of Texas Tech and ended up in scuba and he's not very happy about it. But it tells the story of these kids that are raised, many of them, in the hood. One of the kids, five years old, his father breaks into the trailer that he was living, the little boy was living with his mother and the father comes in, if you can imagine, shoots and kills the little boy's mother. The police come, they chase the man, and as the police are about to capture him, the man shoots and kills himself. That little boy lost his mother and his father at that age. Do you think that's going to have an impact upon his life? Can you imagine? Another two boys that were going through tremendous pain in their adulthood because they were, uh, their, their mom was a drug addict and their dad was in prison. And there were times she would just disappear and they would be left without any food on the verge of starvation. And finally, the social services came and took these little boys and put them in foster homes where they were abused repeatedly. So these kids are able, they say you got three options if you're in the hood. You can play sports, you can go to the military, or you can go to prison. And this is the story of what's happening in our culture. The second individual that I would talk about is, is her name is Miss Brittany, Brittany Wagner, and she's the academic counselor. She is the boy's mama. And they love her. And it is just, you watch these interactions and she's like pleading with them and saying, you want to go to Auburn, you can't go to Auburn unless you get your grades. You've got to go to class. She pleads with them. She cries, please go, 
please go. I am a failure because you're not going to class. And you see this, this going on and on. And, and she is the star, really, of the show. The third one oh, is Coach Stevens, Coach Buddy Stevens. And talking about this is why, well, the kids, their language and his language, the coach. Oh, my goodness. Um, and it's kind of comical because they do the Lord's Prayer. And, and it's like, he sounds like an auctioneer. Our Father, our heaven, I'll be done. That kingdom, the world be done. And then, and then they, they all step back. He's like, if you, you know, it's like, what? This is crazy. This is like, it's like, you know, holy water or something. You know, you're going to sprinkle it on the people and everything's going to be okay. It's like, ah, this guy, he doesn't listen well. He's profane. He doesn't speak well. Um. Uh, but boy, he gets lit up on social media. There's two seasons of Coach Stevens in Eastern Mississippi Community College. The second season begins with a reflection of Coach Stevens, and he said, I watched the first season, and I did not like the man I saw. I need to change. And the second season <laughs> is this poor guy trying to change, not very successfully. He has a lot more failures than he does success. But as I think about this whole deal is that, that our suffering can refine us. It's the wound that says, wait a minute, I'm mortal. I'm not perfect. I need to repent. I need to change. It's, if we don't have the pain, we won't change. And so the pain comes, and this is what he says in, in 1 Peter, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what we see is that our faith is like gold and it's lifted up. And, you know, if you want to improve the quality of the gold, you, you light it up, you heat it up, and the impurities of the gold will rise to the top and you can scrape the scum off. You, if you want to get more impurities out of the gold, you turn the heat up. And maybe you can say, well, maybe the reason I'm suffering is because God is trying to redeem me. God is trying to refine me. God is trying to help me to grow. And if you can frame it like that, then you can, in some ways, you can welcome this and that there is a purpose to this, the purpose to be more trusting in Christ, to be more empathetic towards other people, to get out of my own world and to quit my sympathy for myself, my, my pity parties, which I can really throw and it's, you know, it, this can move us out of that. Here's my question. What is it that after he was so brutally abused by his brothers and so absolutely humiliated and rejected falsely by Mrs. Potiphar that kept Joseph on the focus path. And that's why I say you got to go back to chapter 37 and you'll see a word that appears again and again in that text. And it is the same word that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, four words, I have a dream. Joseph had a dream. And regardless of all of these things that were taking place in his suffering, he had a dream. And it was that dream that kept him focused and locked in. In the absence of having a dream, a vision of something better, we will collapse. And as Christians, we lean into the dream of John in Revelation, who said, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and it's coming. And there'll be no more sorrow, no more sadness, no more tears. All of those things will be wiped away. That is our dream, the dream of eternal life. And that's why when Jesus was upon the cross being crucified, he understood that this was not his final destination, but there was a resurrection that would follow. And that's who we are as people of faith. Something better is yet to come. And so with this, we have this understanding of a dream that's going to help us, whether we're successful or whether we're suffering, this dream is going to compel us into a great future. And with that, we have the ability to look in a new way.
Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I can't, I really can't help you with a dream. The dream emerges in our hearts when we know Jesus Christ. If you don't have that dream, I think all you're dreaming about is going to be getting stuff, and at some point that turns into a nightmare. There's a better dream, and that dream is Jesus. Give your life to him. And so this evening, as Jay alluded to, we're going to be having a very special service of confirmation. Our 13 and 14-year-olds will be gathered with us. And uh, I will lay my hand on 56 heads and say, the Lord defend you with his heavenly grace and by his spirit confirm you in the faith and fellowship of all true disciples of Jesus Christ. And they will be welcomed into the church. And so as our, if our servers or our hosts would come, uh, our, our water boys and water girls would come at this time uh, and, and find your places here. Let me just kind of set this up for you, if you would. Um, a lot of our students were baptized as infants, and they feel a little cheated that they didn't get dunked in the tank. And sensing that, we want to say, no, no, we need to reframe it in a different way. And we need to say that you were loved even when you were a baby. You were loved when you were a child. And so this is the way to frame it until he or she, by the power of God, shall accept for himself or herself the gift of salvation and be confirmed as a full and responsible member of Christ's holy church. Tonight is the culmination of the dream of those parents taking those vows, saying, I want my child to be confirmed and to trust in Jesus Christ and to unite in membership vows with our church. I want you to think back in your life at that moment when you were baptized. You may have been, as I was, an infant. I want you to think about how much your mom and your dad or whoever it was that brought you to that place, how much they loved you. You may have been a child, kind of like Virginia, when she was six and a half or seven and a half in Texas, and her daddy was with her and her older sister, I believe, and they were in this uh, babstery here that was painted by somebody during the Great Depression. He painted this for $5 was the story. 1937, 1938, in those years, Virginia is the smaller of the two. I believe that's your older sister with you, Virginia. Am I right? And so this is her story. And, and as she told me about this, she said, I have a picture. I want you to remember today. All of those people who've been in your life, whom you probably made suffer, so that you might have the success of knowing Jesus Christ, who've loved you, who've birthed you, who've held your hand, who took you to school. Maybe your baptism was recent, as was Phil's, who's going to be uniting in membership vows with our church. And I did get you out of the water. (laughs) Think about all the people been praying for Phil, 
all the people invested in his life all of these years, Sandy and all of the folks, been loved. Jay, think about your mom and dad. Think about your wife. And think about your children. That one day they will be understanding this and getting it. And this is our prayer that these 13 and 14 year old students, one of whom saying this morning, she was confirmed, Caroline was confirmed last year at this time. She's now singing in the chapel that they will not just join the youth group, they'll join our church and we'll have them for the rest of their lives. This is huge. So it's a time for you to pray, a time for you to remember and to give thanks for all of those people who have loved you and an opportunity for us to love others and to see who God has put in front of us that we might have success in leading them to the Lord. So, this is the sacrament of, of initiation. It's there to remind us of baptism, is, is there to answer those questions. You trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, truly and earnestly repent of your sins. This is not a baptism. This is to remember your baptism. And so after we reaffirm our vows, then we're going to invite you to come, just like we do for communion. Uh, this is less messy than Ash Wednesday when we mess up your face and your makeup. We're just going to get you a little wet. We're going to make the sign of the cross. Jay, do you have some water? You want to do this with me? And we'll demonstrate here what this looks like. Okay. Tom, remember your baptism and be thankful. Jay, remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. Amen. Through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift, offered without price. Together, we confess and believe and are saved according to Romans chapter 10 and 11. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Through the reaffirmation of, of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. I ask you, brothers and sisters in Christ, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I do. Do you truly and earnestly repent of your sin? I do. Do you desire to reaffirm your baptism in the Christian faith? I do. If you've never been baptized, let this be a starter set for you. We would love to baptize you. Jesus said there are two things that all followers of him should do. One is baptism and one is communion. That's why we have those two sacraments. If you've never been baptized, we've got the water, we've got the time, we want to do that. But this is for everyone. It, we invite all to come. We're going to be um, just like we do for communion, just like we do for Ash Wednesday. Uh, so hosts, we're ready to go. And so this is your opportunity to remember your baptism.